message that absolutely hit me out of nowhere. I, ha I still, to, to, to this moment, have no idea how I even ended up here in Acts 18 this week as I was going through God's Word and doing some studying in various places, and I still have no idea how I arrived at Acts chapter 18. But boy, I sure am glad. I sure am glad that I got there. Amen. Acts chapter 18, if you have it, I'll invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able. And let's see exactly what the Word of the Lord says. We're going to begin here, of course, in verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because, and then this is what the word of the Lord adds in here to, to give us some context for what had happened. Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit. I want you to mark that little phrase right there. Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Christ, that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now look this way a moment, we're going to pray. When I ask this question this morning, what do we do whenever we feel that all has failed? No matter how hard that we've tried, no matter what effort that we've put forth, we have done our best to live this Christian life as, as best as we humanly possibly can. But no matter how hard that you have tried to do what God has purposed you to do, what He has burdened you to do, all of a sudden you're met with a slap in the face. Um, it, there's a tidal wave of discouragement that has hit your life. And the door that you thought would be open, the door that you thought would be open, at that time in your life was slammed shut. What do you do? What do you do during this time? Well, I want to talk to you on this subject, and it'll make sense as we go through the message, but the title of this is going to be The House Next Door. The House Next Door. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you, Lord, that we can call upon your name. Lord, the good words that we have heard sung here today. God, we ask that you would touch, you would bless, you would anoint at this time. Lord, anoint me as your preacher that I not uh, uh, preach, Lord, from my words, but say only thy words. And Lord, I ask that you would use us mightily in this time. Lord, save souls abundantly. If there's someone that's lost here today, save that soul before it's everlasting too late. Someone that's watching by live stream, God, I ask that you would touch and you would save that soul before it's everlasting too late. And Father, we're going to thank you for it. We're going to praise you for it right now because we humbly ask all this in the wonderful, blessed name of Jesus we do pray. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. You can be seated. Here, whenever we come to Acts chapter 18, understand that we pick up in Paul's life during what is called his second missionary journey. Now what that means is that Paul has been some places, he's seen some things, he has experienced some things, but here whenever he comes to the city of Corinth, he comes different. He's limping in his life. He's discouraged here. He comes discouraged, he comes tired, he comes weary, and perhaps we get clues here that Paul is even physically ill in his body. But understand that if you were already tired, if you were already weak, if you were already weary, if you were already discouraged, especially as a preacher of the gospel, then Corinth was not the place for you. That was not the place that you, uh, that, that, that you would think that the Lord would schedule you to go for a much needed victory in your life. 
Understand a little bit about Corinth here so I can give you a flavor of the context in which we're in. In all of human history, all of human history, you go back from the time of the Garden of Eden all the way to present day 2023, in all of human history, understand that Corinth was probably one of the vilest and most wicked cities that has ever existed. In fact, the things that took place in Corinth would actually make New York, L.A., Las Vegas, and even Sodom and Gomorrah blush at some of the things that would take place in Corinth. But understand that this whole missionary journey has been a tough thing. This whole missionary journey started out on a sour note. If you remember during his first missionary journey. It was him and a man by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas was with him through thick and thin. Barnabas was persecuted just as he was persecuted. But then whenever they, they, they returned back to Antioch, there was a disagreement among he and Barnabas. Because they had a disagreement, they had a, 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 a little scuff uh, over a man by the name of John Mark because Paul said that John Mark had not been faithful. Well, Barnabas being more compassionate, Barnabas being more understanding, Paul being more full of zeal, Paul being somebody that, that, that wanted it his way or the highway, Paul said, well, let me tell you something. I'm going out on my second missionary journey, and John Mark will not be going with me. Well, Barnabas said, well, if John Mark's not going with you, then I'm not going with you. So therefore, he had lost his closest companion. He had lost his prayer partner. He had lost the one that he had went through thick and thin with. So Paul takes another man, you may have heard of him, by the name of Silas. And he and Silas take off and they begin this second missionary journey. Well, they start in the area of Syria. After they have Syria, they go into the area of Cilicia. And all of a sudden, there's a marvelous time. There is marvelous uh, 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 results that's happening. They're spreading the gospel. They're planning churches. They're creating churches. They're strengthening churches. Well, then they go into the area of Galatia. Well, whenever they're in Galatia, the Lord strengthens them once again and adds to their entourage. There's a young man by the name, you may have heard of him, his name is Timothy. And there they pick up Timothy. So Timothy joins them. And then after that, they of course cross over into Europe. And for the first time in human history, we have the gospel being taken to the area of Europe whenever they walk into the city of Philippi. And as they go into Philippi, it's great things. They're rejoicing. They meet a lady by the name of Lydia. And Lydia invites them into their home and she strengthens them and she gives them love offerings and she helps them and everything great and all of Lydia's household receives the Lord it's been a great thing it's been a, they're, they're, they're strengthened once again but don't you know just as soon as you're prospering just as soon as you're successful just as soon as you see people give their life to the Lord the devil is on you so therefore they are met with big opposition in Philippi. Things are starting to get rough. And there you go, Paul and Silas, they're arrested. They're thrown into the jail. And it's there that we have this wonderful thing where, where they begin to sing out at midnight. And of course, the Lord sends an earthquake. The jail crumbles and they get out, but they don't leave. Instead, there's a jailer that's close by and they say, hey, we're going to go home with you. And they go home with the jailer and the entire household gets saved. So understand that the Lord takes this discouragement. He takes this awful thing. And don't you know, He turns it around. Well, guess what? They leave Philippi and they go into the area of Thessalonica. And as they're in the area of Thessalonica, they, they, they begin preaching. People are getting saved. They're having a spirit of revival. And then before you know it, there is a group of angry Jews that rise up against them trying to kill them. In fact, it's so bad that they slip out and they leave Thessalonica and they go to the area of Berea. Now Berea is another place where they, they, can, they can calm down, they can settle down, they got rest in Berea for their weariness, they got some encouragement in Berea, but don't you know, watch this, the same devil that, 
The same devil that messed with them in Thessalonica shows up in Berea by the same people. The same angry mob, the same angry Jews of Thessalonica chase them all the way into Berea and it gets so heated, it gets so bad, watch very closely, that Paul has to break off from, from Timothy, has to break off from Silas, and guess where he heads to? He heads to the area of Athens. Now Athens is a whole different ballgame because Athens is the philosophical area. Athens is the area of sophistication. Athens is the university crowd, the educated crowd, the ones that, 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 that sit around with their, their, their glasses in the corner of their mouth and, 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 and ponder on, on, on Socrates and Plato and all these, 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 these philosophers of old times. And, and, and so what does he do? Paul does what he always does. Paul presents the gospel and he does it in an intellectual way. He, he starts to tell them about Jesus and this man. But watch what happens. There was only a few that trusted the Lord in Athens. That's a hard crowd to reach, folks. That's a hard crowd to reach. But watch what happens here. He also noticed that the devil wasn't bothering him in Athens. You ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that, that, that whenever you're not being effective, the devil don't mess with you? It's all, oh my Lord, that'll preach right there. Have you ever noticed that whenever you're not being effective, that even the devil, understand that you're under attack because you're under an anointing. Do you hear this? You're under attack because you're under assignment. You're there for a purpose. You're there for a reason. So now watch this. Paul, he's discouraged, he's down, he's alone, and he leaves Athens and the Lord plants Corinth right in his way. The Lord plants Corinth right in his way. He's tired, he's discouraged, he's sick, but honey, can I tell you something? I am so thankful that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. I'm thankful to know this morning that we have a Savior who knows what we're going through, who knows what we feel, who knows the pain, who knows the heartache that we have. We have a Savior and a mediator that knows what we go through, hallelujah. So watch what happens. I want to show you. I want to show you here how this is an unapparent victory. This is not an obvious victory that he goes into this place of Corinth and watch what happens whenever we look at the house next door. Number one, I want to say this. Number one, how we're strengthened, how we're encouraged is number one. The Lord gives us an ability to share. Now, what does that mean? Paul has been isolated from his journey. Understand that before he got here to Corinth, who did I say was with him? I said Silas was with him. I said Timothy was with him. And you read it and even Luke, the one who wrote the book of Acts, was with him. But here he has been set apart. He has been set aside. He has been isolated and separated. Watch from his three prayer partners, the three guys that was there, the three guys that he could lean on, the three guys that he could join up with. But look what happens, hallelujah, in verse number two and three. One more time, watch it up here. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, and then verse 3 says this, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, watch, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Folks, can I tell you something this morning? It's awful good to have the Lord with us. It's awful good to have the Lord with us. It's so good, but I also know what it is out of hurt and out of disappointment to turn up our nose and say, you know what? I only need the Lord. Now help me, hold on now. I only need him. I only need him. It's just me and him. He's the only one that I can lean on. He's the only one that I can trust. I don't need nobody else because I'm hurt, because I'm disappointed in people, because I'm disappointed in what they've done. But watch this. The truth of the matter is, is that we need some good Christian brothers and sisters. We need some people, watch, that we can share our heavy load with. Now watch this, Galatians 6, 2 and 3, watch what it says. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, 
For if any man, watch, watch closely. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Do you see how those two go together? I can turn up my nose. I can think I'm something. I can think I'm strong. I can think I've got it all together. But we need some good Christian brothers and sisters to share our burdens with. That's what we got to have. But notice this. Notice this. Notice how these two people, how, these, how Paul finds these two people. They have been through their own hardships. They had to leave their family. They had to leave their home. They had to leave their business. They had to leave everything. Why? Because they were ran out of Rome. The, the emperor said, you got to go. Caesar said, you've got to go. There was so much. You study this in history, and there was such chaos in Rome that he kicked out all the Christians. So they had to leave this place, their home, their place that, that, that they had been used to, so they find each other in the most sinful place they could find each other, in Corinth. Here they are. Notice this. Notice also how they find each other. They find each other, how? Because they share their occupation. They share, listen, you don't know when you're going to meet the person that God has put you with. The, the prayer partner that God has put you with. Hey, I, it's good to meet them here in the house of the Lord, but listen, you might be talking to somebody out at the, at the 7-Eleven, and all of a sudden God crossed y'all's path just at the right time, at the right place, and they're strengthening you, and you're strengthening them, and everything is happening just the way that it's supposed to be, the way that God has orchestrated it to happen. But watch this. Understand, how can we stand in the world without sharing the load with our brothers and sisters in Christ? How can we do that? The Lord puts two new fellow servants of Christ in the life of Paul right when he needed it the most. Right when he couldn't go on. And watch this, it even gets better. You ready for this? It even gets better. Because there's only one thing that's better than new friends, and that's if you get some old ones. Now watch what happens in verse 5. Look, what, look, two old friends come along in verse 5. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. When Paul was at his low point, he was encouraged because somebody came along that shared his faith. Somebody came along that shared his burden. Somebody came along that shared what mattered to him. You can always tell when you hook up with somebody because your burden is is their burden. Your desire is their desire. And they put people together and we share this together. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of the house of God is that we can get in here as people together and share this together. Because I go through hell from week to week. You go through hell from week to week. But the Lord comes in and He blesses each other and He helps us and He uplifts us and He encourages us. This is what we got to have. Hallelujah. But watch number two. Watch number two. I love this. Not only does He give somebody for, a, for us to share this with, but look, there's a shift. There's a shift. Oh, I gotta say, I gotta show this to you. Verse number five again. Watch one more time in verse number five. The shift that happens. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, watch, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now that 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 phrase is an unusual phrase. In fact, when you read it in the Greek, there's a lot of dispute over what it means. So I'm going to try to help you out as best as I know how. He was, watch this, he was squeezed in his spirit. Watch. He was compressed in his spirit. Okay, now hold on, hold on, hold on. Watch this. What makes more of an impact? I'm going to run. Go over to mercy. What makes more of an impact? If I hit you with my open hand or if I hit you with my compressed, squeezed fist? Which one makes more, oh my Lord, which one makes more of an impact? Hold on, what makes more of an impact? An arrow that's blunt on the end or an arrow that's been compressed and squeezed to a point? Do you see this? In fact, watch, 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 watch. He's being compressed. He's being squeezed. It's right here that translations say that it's not that Paul was just compressed in his spirit. It's that this time, watch, he was squeezed together and he began to focus all of his energy on the ministry. 
just on the ministry. What does that mean? Right, I thought that's what he was already doing before. But watch, you didn't read the Bible. Watch verse 3. Verse 3 said that he was what? A tent maker. And verse 4, what did verse 4 said? Verse 4 said that he was only preaching Sabbath to Sabbath. Now what does that mean? That means that Paul is in the middle of his second missionary journey and guess what he's doing? He's still working a 9 to 5. He's still working as a tent maker. He's still supporting the ministry. He's still doing what he's doing. And watch this right here. In other epistles, he wrote that he would labor night and day because he didn't want to be chargeable to any man. He didn't want it to be a burden, a financial burden. One of Paul's biggest fears was that somehow people would get the wrong idea and think that Paul was preaching for handouts. He didn't want the gospel to be thought of as a financial burden and something that was dishonest. So watch this right here. How many of you know that people can get tore up in a church when people start talking about money? So he said, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to cause the gospel to seem this way. I don't want to cause the gospel to seem like it's something of a financial burden. So Paul continued his trade. He was a tent maker. You know what that is? That's a leather worker. He would take the hide of goats. He would take the hair off and the hair would be made, would be woven to, to, to form Cilicia. And all of a sudden he would, he, he would take that hide and tan that hide and they would make the tents and sell the tents. He was working night and day night and day working for the gospel but watch this right here but according to the other uh, letters that he wrote something happens in Corinth because here according to 1 Thessalonians 3 6 according to Philippians 4 15 according to 2 Corinthians 11 9 there was something changing because Timothy comes back from Thessalonica Remember, Thessalonica was the place that had all the, the riots. Thessalonica was the place that he was run out of town because of the angry Jews. But Timothy comes back and said, Paul, you ain't going to believe this. The gospel is spreading through Thessalonica like you wouldn't believe. People are getting saved like you wouldn't believe. He said, he said it's busting out of the churches like you wouldn't believe. Paul discouraged. Paul weak. Paul out of his mind. And he says, What? He says, you mean the time that I spent in Thessalonica, you mean it wasn't in vain? You mean the, the labor that I put in, it wasn't in vain? They said, oh no. They said, you wouldn't believe it, but watch what happens too. Then according to, 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 to the, the epistles, uh, guess who what? Silas comes back. And he's come back from Philippi. He writes that the Philippians were the only ones that had supported him anyway. And then he gets this gift, this love offering. And Paul looks at the love offer. He said, I don't know what's happening. I'm down and I'm out. I'm at the lowest point of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm down. And you, Timothy, you come back with this good news about people getting saved and the church is, is, is blowing up and everything's great. And then all of a sudden Silas says, well, hold on. Let me bless you one more time. And he hands him this big old love offering from Lydia and Philippi. And therefore, he says, I don't even have to work as a tent maker anymore. Everything is good. He said, I can focus all of my efforts on the Word of God. He said, oh, this is getting good. He said, this is, this is great. He said, I can't believe how God's blessing me. What was happening with Paul? He was weak. He was down. He was out. And God knows how to bless you at the right time to give the right impact to lift you up. Hallelujah. There was a shift. There was a shift. Somebody say shift. There was a shift in his spirit. But now I like this. I like this. Lord have mercy. I like this. Did you notice what the Word of God, it was so subtle. It was so subtle. Because in verse 4, the Word of God says that He persuaded, listen, He persuaded the Jews and Greeks. But then in verse 5, watch what it says. In verse 5 it says that He testified to the Jews. I have went, I have shifted. I have shifted from persuading to now testifying. Now what's the difference? Persuading is done through intellect. It's reasoning. It's me giving you the intellectual version of, 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 of who Jesus is. He was doing that in Athens. He had gotten so used to doing the intellectual thing in Athens that he forgot what it meant. Oh my God, I'm going to run. He forgot what it meant to have a personal connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But when his old friends come back, remember, not his new friends, but when his old friends come, the ones that shared the same heartache that he had in Thessalonica, he said, hold on just a minute. I remember back then, I can remember what was happening back then. And they began to encourage him and say, Hey Paul, you remember what happened to you back there in Thessalonica? You remember in Berea when they tried to kill you? You remember in Philippi whenever we sang the walls down? You remember when all that right there happened? And Paul shifted from telling you intellectually about Jesus to let me testify from a first person point of view at what Jesus has done for me personally in my life. He went from being intellectual to personal. Personal. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Hallelujah. Now hold on. Hold on. We do this. We, I'm convinced that the reason why we get so weary, the reason why we get so discouraged is because we make this harder than it has to be. If I, if I have to twist your arm and I have to persuade you, and I have to convince you of who Jesus is, then it's awful hard to reach you. But all i got to do is open up my mouth and tell you what He's done for me. Listen, we have to... <laughs> we have to shift. Listen, we have to shift. We have to make this shift in not what we're doing but how we're doing it. We have to shift to tell people about Jesus, about what He's done for us. That's all you've ever been called to do. You've not been called to be scholars. You've not been called to be theologians. You've not been called to be people that's going to argue your point. The only thing you've been called to do is open up your mouth and everything that hath breath, let them praise the Lord. That's all you've been ever called to do. Hallelujah. There was a shift that was in his spirit. But now hold on. Don't, don't, don't. Watch verse 6. Number 3, I'm going to call this shake. Watch this. Verse number 3. Or verse number 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook. Somebody say shook. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now hold on. I would love to tell you that it's all going to be good. After you shift, after you've changed the way that you think, after you've changed the way that you minister, after you've changed the way that you witness, I would love to tell you that everything's going to be good, but let me tell you what the real problem is. Just because it's shifted in you don't mean that everything around you is going to shift. In fact, in <laughs> Let me help you. In fact, what it really means is that now that you've shifted, everything is even more out of alignment with you. So now, maybe even the stuff that didn't bother you before bothers you even more. Now the devil, that maybe he, he bothered you a little bit before, but now he's coming after you with both barrels. Because just because... That, that just because that you've shifted... Now, hold on. Think about Paul. Think about what, what he's doing. I'm happy. Lord, have mercy. I can finally devote all of my time to preaching the Word of God. Where had he been preaching? The synagogue. That's where he always preaches. The synagogue. From Sabbath to Sabbath. Now he's happy. He's inflamed in his spirit. Lord, have mercy. I can give it all that I've got. I can go at this thing. And all of a sudden, he goes there and they say, we don't want you. The door that had been opened, boom, right in his face. Every last one of this word opposed themselves. What that means is they came together as one and said, you got to go. You're out. But uh, what? No, no, no. what? I, I, I've just got it all together. I've just, I, I, I've, I, fi I finally made my mark. I finally, I finally got to the place where I have been. Listen, this is the middle of my second, there, my second missionary journey. I'm ready to give it all I've got. Boom. Ain't that how it works? Ain't that how it works? The door is slammed right in his face. 
what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? But watch, watch, watch. Paul makes two Old Testament gestures. Two Old Testament Jewish gestures. Watch this. He shakes, he shakes the dust off of his raiment. In the, now, now, hold on. Now, if they weren't mad before, they're really mad now. Then, he says this, the other gesture. He says, your blood is upon your own heads. Now listen, if you don't think, if you don't think the Bible teaches individual responsibility, this is it. Your blood is upon your own heads. He said, I have presented the gospel to you. He said, I have preached my guts out. He said, I've told you what, who Jesus is. I've told you what salvation means. I've told you all, and you've shut the door. Though your blood is upon your heads, you will give an account for what you've done. And they said, okay. They said, that's fine. And he, oh, I love this. Lord, have mercy. I love this so much. This is the same thing that Jesus told his disciples to do. If you remember Mark chapter 6, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth rejects. He could do no miracles in Nazareth because of how they rejected him. They didn't believe in him. They said, is this the carpenter's son? There's nothing good that could ever come out of Nazareth. There's no way. And what did Jesus do? Jesus took the disciples and showed them what it meant to be rejected before he ever sent them out. He said, look, even my own people won't accept me. But he said, what do you do? He said, you simply shake the dust off your feet and keep on going. He said, let it be a testimony against them. And what did they do? They went right on down the street and had revival. They went right on down the street and won many to him. But they kept on going. Listen, let me help you out. Let me help you out. Do you realize that it is impossible for you to serve the Lord that it is impossible for you to minister. It is impossible for you to witness. It is impossible for you to be a Christian and not be met with offenses. You are going to be met with offenses all the time. In fact, Jesus said it Himself in Luke 17, 1. He said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. That's what He said. But now, hold on, hold on, hold on just a minute. I'm not saying that it's not offensive. But what I am saying is don't be offended. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Offenses is circumstantial. Offended is a choice. Oh, you better tweak that out today. I want you to tweak that out today, okay? Listen, do you hear what I just said? I said offenses, offenses is circumstantial. But offended is a choice. You have a choice. You cannot. There is no way that you can take people who don't want to go. There's no way. Obstinate people are heavier to carry than willing people. You ever tried to save somebody that was drowning? You have, what do they always teach you? Come up behind them. You come up in front of them, both of y'all dying. Because obstinate people are heavier people. You take the same 250 pound man who's fighting against you as hard as he can and there's no way to carry him but you take a, the same 250 man that's there who's willing to go with you, he's a lighter load. People who are against you, people who don't want anything to do with you, people who are snubbing their nose at you, people who don't want to hear your gospel, who don't want to hear Jesus, who don't want to hear nothing you got to say about your testimony, they are obstinate people. You share it, you give it to them, you let it lay, and their blood is upon their own heads. That's the way it goes. If somebody turns their, 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 their back on you, somebody walks away, shake it off. Shake it off. Lord, have mercy. Shake it off. You've got to shake it off. This is not the first time. This is not the first time that Paul had to shake it off. This won't be the last time that Paul has to shake it off. Do you realize what happens ten chapters later? Watch. Ten chapters later, Paul is not limping to Corinth. Ten chapters later, Paul is crawling up on the shoreline of Malta. Shipwrecked. Eurachilodon has come and destroyed the ship that's headed to Rome. And there it was. It was Paul and Luke. And there they are crawling up on the shores of Malta. 
And it's there as they're crawling up on the shoreline and Paul is drenched. Paul is freezing. Paul is, is, is worn out and he's cold and he's tired. And what, uh, the only thing he wants to do is just build himself a fire. Oh, but he gets the wood and he brings the wood in and he gets it all together and everything's good. And then the next thing you know, he, he, he lights the fire. And listen, it's good to have the fire. I love having the fire in church. But the problem with the fire is the fire will draw the snake. The, the enemy loves the heat just like you like it. He loves the light. He loves that light, that sparkle, that glimmer. He loves there. And he gets over there. And what happens? Paul gets the wood together and he looks up and his hands have been frozen cold. And he finally gets a little feeling in his hands. And he looks down and there's a viper that's hanging on his hand. But Paul, oh, what you going to do, Paul? What's going to happen now, Paul? Oh, Paul, you, this thing's deadly poison. This thing should have you dead in about two minutes. And look, I love this because all the men are looking. All the men are sitting there watching him going, what's he going to do now? Listen, I hate to disappoint you because I'm not going down like that. I'm shaking the devil off in the fire and I'm keeping on going. He's not getting me down. I'm preaching the word. You thought I was going to crumble, honey, but I'm going through with Jesus Christ and ain't nobody going to have... I'm shaking it off. I'm shaking it off. I'm shaking it off. He ain't tearing me down. Hallelujah. Listen, listen. Anytime you stretch forth your hand to do anything for the enemy, he's waiting to latch on. Anytime you stretch forth your hand to touch lives, anytime you stretch forth your hands to help somebody, anytime you stretch forth your hands to minister, the devil is waiting to latch on. But he ain't getting me. I'm praising Jesus anyway. I'm going through with him. Hallelujah. Shake it off. Hallelujah. Shake it off. Shake it off. Listen, hold on. I can still go. I can still go with the devil on my hand as long as the venom's not in my heart. I can still make it with him on my hand. But if I allow his bitterness, if I allow, if I allow that hardship to take up residence, and his venom gets in my heart, that's when I'm going down. Shake it off. Oh, but watch this. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord. I, that, that ain't even the best part, okay? Watch this. Verse 4, or excuse me, number 4. I'm going to call this shout. You know why I'm going to call it shout? Because it's going to make you want to shout. Watch this. I shouted for 30 minutes. L look at this. Paul said, I'm shaking off the dust from my feet. I'm packing up and leaving. But watch this. He said, I'm only going to preach to the Gentiles. But now watch verse 7. Look at this. I, I did, didn't read this before, but watch this. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, watch closely, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now hold on. Paul said... I'm done with y'all. He said, I'm packing up. I'm leaving. I, I'm finished with y'all. And he moved next door. Y'all didn't get that. Yeah, y'all going, what? Listen, he left the synagogue and went next door. What I'm trying to tell you is that the next door might literally be Next door. Do you hear what I'm saying? When that one door was shut, the one right next door was open. Now this is what got me. This is what this is what blew my mind. Is because now, oh Lord, have mercy. The door was slammed. Look at verse number eight. This is I, I, ooh, watch. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Y'all read right past it. Crispus, the chief ruler of the, sa the same synagogue he had preached in from Sabbath to Sabbath. The same synagogue that came together and slammed the door in his face. The pastor of the church that kicked him out got saved. 
And not only did he get saved, the whole house got saved. Do you see how the Lord works? He literally was met with, with opposition. He was met with somebody tearing him down. He was met with kicking him out. And he said, I'm packing up and I'm moving next door. And right next door was the right place to be. What, can I tell you what happens right here? Listen, rejection, rejection that you suffer is not really rejection. Rejection that you suffer is actually redirection. And listen, what makes rejection redirection is your reaction. Did you hear what I just said? What makes rejection redirection all depends on your reaction. If you get mad, you snubbed up the venom in your heart, I'm walking away, I'm leaving alone, then guess what? You're done. You're done. But he said, I'm, I'm shaking it off. It's on your head, but I ain't going far. I'm going to go next door. And the pastor gets saved. Do you see what happens in your life and my life whenever we're met with these things, these oppositions, these things that the devil whispers in your ears and tells you that it's over with, that it's hopeless, that there's nothing that can be done? Can I tell you there's a God in heaven that says I've had my hand on this thing the whole time and I'm leading and I'm guiding and I'm directing you. I'm orchestrating it from the bowels of heaven and I'm trying to tell you that I'm pouring out a blessing in which you cannot receive. Hallelujah. Folks, are you willing, are you willing to allow the Lord to work in you so that He can take you and now work in you and now work through you to touch somebody else? Not get your feelings in the way, not get your lip in the way, not get your tongue in the way, but allow Him to use you to reach the one person that he's put you there to reach. Can I tell you, it said that it was just, it was just, it was just a little small phrase. Watch what it said. Watch what it said. Four, four words. And many of the Corinthians. Many of the Corinthians. The same city that there was orgies on the street. The same city that had paganism busting at the scene. The same city that would not hear anything of Jesus. Many of the Corinthians. Watch how this worked. Hearing, believing, baptized. Ain't that how it always works? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, they heard, they believed, they changed, and they showed that with their testimony of baptism. Oh my Lord, listen, don't let that dead end be your dead end. Just because somebody has slammed the door, just because you feel like you failed, just because you feel like you can't go on, if you'll purpose in your heart and say, Lord, I don't know what this is for. I don't know why I have reached this place. I don't know why it feels like this. But I know without a doubt that you have put me here for a purpose in this season, in this place, at this time. Use me for whatever you see fit. And I'm going to tell you something. Right next door is where your blessing is going to be. Let's stand all over the place. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. You know, I don't know what you're in need of here at this place, at this time. But I've often said, and I'll say it again today, you're not here by accident. You're not here by accident today. The Lord has you here for a specific purpose. You needed this word. He spoke to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's dealing with your heart here today. You're lost. You're undone. That's, that's, that makes all the difference. To somebody that's saved, they understand that they have purpose. They understand they're here for a reason. But you're standing there and you're saying, Preacher, I'm unsettled in my heart. I'm unsettled in my soul. Folks, can I tell you that Jesus, Jesus wants to save you here today. Jesus wants to save you here today. You say, Ryan, how does that happen? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be 
Say, believe in your heart. Oh, yes, He can do it. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm lost. I don't know Him as Savior. I don't know Him as Savior. But I want to know Him as Savior today. I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. If that's you here today, I want you to slide your hand up here all across this auditorium. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Listen, don't go home. Don't go home like this. Go home victorious. Go home shouting. Go home knowing that you know that you know that if today is the last day that you have here on this earth, it's all settled. Your name's written in heaven, honey. Know that for sure. You can know it today. If you're here today, you say, Preacher, I'm facing something. I'm facing opposition. I'm facing problems. I'm facing a trial. I'm facing heartache. Remember me in prayer today. If that's you, I want you to slide your hand up right here all over this auditorium. Listen, the Lord knows exactly what we need, folks. The Lord knows exactly what we need. Whatever your need is here today, I ask you to come. This altar is open. There's already people on the altar right now. Listen, you come. You pour your heart.